All right, everybody good? Good. Just let out, let out some, some air. I know you got your masks on, but it's like we can relax now, okay? We're here. We made it. We're safe. We're all healthy. Praise God. And that might not have been the case, right? But we got the blessing of the Lord on our lives. So um, I'm just going to read from Luke chapter 4. He's quoting from Isaiah 61. And I'll go back to Isaiah for a little bit too. And then even just share a little bit about what I said yesterday when the young prophets were here. Because we've learned a lot over the years. And uh, they're young prophets, so a lot of them are in their 20s and 30s. So we want to help them to glean from some of the things that we might have had to learn the hard way. And the whole gift of the prophetic is relatively new in the body of Christ as an accepted thing. In the 50s and 60s and, and early 70s, it wasn't so well known uh, as, as one of the uh, one of the fivefold ministry. The fivefold ministry wasn't even honored the way it should have been. Uh, mostly it was just pastors and evangelists that got most of the uh, of the notoriety, if I could say it that way, and, and that's fine, but we never were supposed to dismiss the role of apostle and prophet, because that says, the Bible says that's the foundation of the church, is built on the apostle and the prophet. So we just really want to cultivate everybody's gift, all fivefold, regardless, beyond that, whatever the gift is that God placed in you, we want it to flourish. And, and this is so key to that. So, you know, the earlier part of Luke chapter 4 is, that he comes into the temple, which was a regular thing that they would do, the synagogues that, that they would have in the towns. The temple really was in Jerusalem, but the synagogues would be in the, in the villages. And he got up and he read from the scroll from the uh, book of Isaiah. And in verse 18 it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Could you say that with me? The year of the Lord's, now say, this is the year of the Lord's favor, okay? That's all I want you to think about right now, is because for us to be here right now, it proves it. It really does. Because there was a million reasons why we might not have been here in this place. And you can't discount that. You can't move on and say, yeah, but, but look at what I don't have. You've got to stop and celebrate the goodness of God and say, whoa, this is a miracle. Because what if during COVID, half the church lost their jobs and they weren't able, even if they would have wanted to continue to provide, they weren't, wouldn't have been able to. But the church continued to give. That's a miracle. Because God shows favor to us. There's blessing on our lives when we're obedient to him. And we can't ever forget that. I'll quote you from Deuteronomy by heart. Like, remember the Lord your God, it's he that gives you the power to get wealth in order that you may establish his covenant in the earth. And, and he's really careful. He says, don't, when you start to prosper, don't get up on your high horse and say, it was my power and the might of my will that caused me to have these goods. No, it's only because of the blessing of God for Christians. Amen. The world might prosper in other ways, but that's just another trick of the enemy. So look, boy, this is really good news. They had been used to hearing that because they had read from the scroll of Isaiah prior, right? They knew that Isaiah said this, but what Jesus says next in verse 20, he says, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. You ever wonder about that? Why would their eyes of everyone there be fixed on him? Because that was just another reading of scripture when they would get together, when they read scripture out loud. Why would that be? Because he had authority. But he was also in his hometown. And they knew who this man was. And all of a sudden, it's like, wait a minute. That's Jesus. That's Joseph's son. And he's standing up and he's speaking with authority. But then he really lays it down. <laughs> He's in verse 21, it says, he began to say to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Whoa! They had to process that one, don't you think? Today this scripture, I want to go back and I'll read it again. It says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. They weren't used to thinking that way. They weren't used to thinking that that would be fulfilled. How about you? Do you know the spirit of God is on you? I hope you say yes, church, please. Come on, let me know that you know the Spirit of God is on the inside. That's the fuel that runs your life. 
And if you're not serving the spirit, you're going to serve your flesh. And you don't want the flesh driving your behavior. But then he gives them really good news because I'm not just going to proclaim good news. I'm going to bring it to the poor. I'm going to bring it to people who are broken, that don't have the goods in their own strength, but the kingdom of God is going to invade their world, and they're going to get tools to not be poor anymore. And not just not financially poor. That could be emotionally poor or a million other ways that people can be broken in life. But then he goes on to say, proclaim liberty to the captives. So people who are in jail are going to be set free. Who's ever bound by sin, who's ever bound by demons, they're going to be set free through the power of God being released into the earth. They weren't used to hearing that. And then the recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And I said it earlier, it's not just 365 days, okay? All these thousands of years had gone by. There was so much sin in the world. Jesus shows up on the scene. And now it's going to be the year, the era of the Lord's favor, because when Jesus fulfills the mission that he came, he was faithful to the mission that God gave him, not just to die on the cross, but to resurrect from the tomb to defeat death. So here we are in 2020, people are still getting healed by the power of God. Somebody should be grateful for that and give me a little word. I've been going five months without you being able to say amen. Oh, I would still serve the Lord even if I never saw somebody get healed, but I'd sure be wondering like, why aren't we seeing it? If we're reading it in the Bible, did he love them more than he loves us? No. He loves us all the same. We just have to step into agreement with his word and believe for faith, for healing. And Lord, help my unbelief. If there's a stronghold of unbelief in me, no. But, but if, if we're going to be the 29th chapter of Acts, which I hope you think through that and say, yeah, there's no reason that that should have ever stopped, then we want to see signs, wonders, and miracles. I mean, we've been doing the healing rooms. I don't even know if Anna could, could tell me off the top of your head. How many years? 15 years we've been doing the healing rooms. And countless number of people have given testimonies. Never came to our church to, as an attend, attendee, but heard about it. Drove to come. Got prayer from faith-filled people on a Saturday in the church. Went home. Got a letter completely free of cancer from one of the sons of one of the women. So look, that's a really important part of our lives, and we have to believe this, that this right now is the year of the Lord's favor. I'm in an era where the favor of God is extended on our lives, not because we earned it, right? But because we surrendered and we said, Lord, I choose to line up under the authority of your voice over my life. Your word is the final answer, okay? The buck stops here. <laughs> and that's how I'm gonna choose to live. So, he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They were looking at him before he said that. <laughs> but then he says it in 21 and, and goes on to say, and all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. So they knew he was the carpenter's son, and yet he seemed to have all this authority. And he says, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. It's, it's a bit of an inauguration of his ministry, don't you think? And verse 22 goes on to say, they are questioning now, okay? Isn't this Joseph's son? And this is what we could call doubt and unbelief. Like, what do you mean today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing? That can be a disease in our hearts. Unbelief can be like a disease that makes us sick. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. A lack of faith can make our hearts sick. And we can just get beaten down. And that could be true for us in, in these last few months, right? That people are beaten down, they're, they're discouraged, they're, they're wired, their temperaments are built that they need to be around other people. But they haven't been able to be around other people. So they have to deal with that. So that's, that's a form of needing that, influ that, that influence of the Holy Spirit, but a fresh baptism as well. Come and fill me a fresh Lord again. And then he start to say a couple of things that, that, that rattle them. And I would call this a power confrontation, right? Because the power structures that are in place all throughout the Bible, whether it's in the book of Nehemiah, right? Nehemiah comes with, with orders from the king, with orders from Cyrus and, and Artaxerxes and all these different kings that said, they have permission to do this, but the power structure that was there opposed them. And we know in the New Testament, 
We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but what? Against principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. So a religious spirit is as much of a principality as any other kind of sinful spirit. And a lack of faith is a form of a religious spirit. Because as soon as you think you know all the answers, you've cut God out of the formula. But we don't know all the answers. We continue to seek him. We are men and women after God's own heart. We're asking, Lord, I want to know more of you. I want to decrease that. You might increase in my life so that you can take charge. And he really hits a nerve in these people. In verse 25, he says, I tell you the truth. Of 24, I'll go back to 24. Truly I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. So the implication there is, these elders are saying, you're just the carpenter's son. You have no real authority. And he's going to try to highlight something for us that we have to be really careful of today, which is unbelief. And being too familiar with things that we cut, we cut God out of the picture. And you know it from when we talk about judging people. And why you can't say, they'll never change. Because you just cut God out of the formula if you say that. And he, he, he doesn't change. God doesn't change. We should be grateful for that. But no matter how bad a person's doing, God's power can still change them. And that is really good news. Really good news. But we might have to change first, especially if it's a close one. And they might have to see the change in us to believe that that change is even possible. And that's one of the best witnesses. I mean, nobody wants to hear that. They want us to just fix their spouse. <laughs> and we come back and say, well, maybe as you get closer to God and you, your walk with God improves, they're going to be drawn to the Jesus in you. But it's challenging to, the, to the, the current structures. The power structures don't like to be threatened. Herod didn't like to be threatened to hear that there was another king on the scene. So he goes and kills all the babies. So what is it today? Well, easily you could say secular humanism is another way of thinking that cuts God out of the picture, which is right out of Psalm 2. Why did the heathen rage and the people plot a vain thing? What's the vain thing? I don't need God. That's a vain thing. Yes, you do. You can't do it on your own. You can't save yourself. You need a Savior. There's sin in your life, and you need a Savior. And we don't want to just do just enough to get into heaven when we die. Right? I just need your blood. That's like vampire Christianity, I heard somebody say. Oh, I just need your blood. I don't have to change my behavior. I just need your blood. Just cover me so I can go to heaven when I die. No, no. That's not the deal. It's we're going to live in fellowship with him and in constant desire to be more like him every day. And as that happens, people are drawn to you. The tax collectors and sinners were drawn to Jesus as if he had a magnet in him. But they weren't drawn to the Pharisees. Ever think about that? Why? Because the Pharisees were very judgmental and legalistic and had to be right and you had to earn favor with them. And Jesus is saying, I can love you, but try to convince you that your sin is pulling you down. I don't have to love your sin to love you and to encourage you to change your life. Tells the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. <laughs> That's loving the person. You don't love them by just saying you can do whatever you want. You have to draw the line for them and then give them an encouraging word. So here we go. Here's the war. He says in verse 25, In truth I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and the great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them. Get it? He was sent to none of the Israelites. Why? Hard hearts. Idolatry, legalism, pride, all those things get in the way because we think we already know everything and there's nothing we need to learn. But we know Elijah did go to somebody, didn't he? <laughs> he went to, verse 26 says, none of them but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. She was about to die. Remember that story? She was about to die. And he said, well, just pour it, make a meal for me first and watch what happens. And she got more oil to fill every jar that she got, right? So God will provide, but we have to have faith to do it. She had to have the faith to step out and be obedient to what the prophet was saying. But this is clearly putting the religious people in a tough spot. Because Jesus just, just insulted them, basically. He said there were many people that needed help. When there was a drought in the land, 
But Elijah didn't go to any of his own people. He goes to a foreigner because she had enough faith to believe God for the miracle. The implication is they didn't. And now they're watching him and they're saying, oh, you're just the carpenter's son. What do you, where, where does this guy think he's getting all this authority? No. And Jesus gives him another one too. And in verse 27, he says, there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elijah and none of them was cleansed. See it? See the theme? Why didn't the lepers in Israel get cleansed? Where did he go? Only Naaman, the Syrian. So he just poked them twice and they didn't like it. And that's what happens. When demons get poked, they make noise. <laughs> and they try to fight back at you. It says, when they heard these things, now if I just could remind you, in, in the prior verse in 22, it says, they spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words. <laughs> he tells them two things about the fact that they're, they're religious in, in the way they're approaching their relationship with God. And it says in verse 28, when they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. So he went from being the hero, wow, he's so impressive, until he touched the thing that they needed to deal with. And instead of being humbled and broken and saying, Lord, I'm so sorry. I recognize what you're trying to show me here. Help me change. Fill me with your power to change. What did they do? It says in verse 29, they rose up, drove him out of the town, and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so that they could throw him down the cliff. <laughs> Whew. Anybody here think violence is the answer? <laughs> is that a common theme in America today? Sure looks like it. It's not the answer, right? But that's what happens. When, when you hit a hornet's nest, they come after you to sting you. So they were going to take him out. But see, when you're walking in the year of the Lord's favor, which Jesus was, what happens? This is so cool in verse 30. But passing through their midst, he went away. It was like God had protected him, put a covering shield over him, and passing through their midst, he just walked away. And I think we really need to hear that word today. Because you get put in these situations where there's three choices and they're all bad. <laughs> you ever feel that way sometimes? Like, man, there just doesn't seem to be any easy way out. But then you have to remember the scripture that says God will always provide a way out. You never get put in a situation where he won't provide a way out. But you could be like, hurry up, God. I really need it. Hurry up. Don't get nervous. He'll tell you. Just listen. Hang in there. And he'll, he works with us. So Jesus walked out of that sentence of them trying to kill him. And God protected him just like he protects us. And then it says he went out and he started to heal people. So the exact thing he said was going to happen today, Isaiah 61, is fulfilled in your hearing. This is here. The kingdom of God is now here in the earth. And if you were saying this, you could say the kingdom of God inside me is here in the earth because it's inside us too. How willing are we to let it out? How willing are we to step out in faith and pray for people? If ever there was a time they're open to listen to a different worldview, it would be right now. Because the things that they've been leaning on don't work. And we know the things that we've been leaning on do work. They're a sure foundation. Blessed is the man who not only hears the things I say, Jesus said in, Luke, in Matthew chapter 7, but does them. He will be like the man who built his house on a rock. And when the storms came and the winds blew, that house stood. Because it was built on the rock, not on the sinking sand of the culture. And we got a lot of sinking sand, don't we? People are building their lives on things that are not eternal. The things that we can't see are eternal. That's what we're counting on. The things that we can see that we do, some people do count on, are temporary. They're all going to go away. We serve an eternal God. So I love verse 40 in Luke chapter 4. It says, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to Jesus. And he laid hands on every one of them. Can you imagine? Every one of them. This is God in the flesh. So patient that however many sick people they could find and bring to him, he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. Woo! This is the season. This is the year of the Lord's favor. And we have to really fight back against unbelief when it tries to pop up its ugly head because it's got a strength to its own. That's why the father of that child that was possessed said, Lord, I do believe, but help my unbelief. Because 
for the reason of unbelief, prevented Jesus from doing some miracles. That's amazing. That shouldn't be the case. Our faith needs to rise up above it and believe for the miracles. All right, the year of the Lord's favor. So I'm going to go to Isaiah 61. If you've got your Bible, Sandy, just go there. I'm reading it from The Voice. And in a decade of the decree, The Voice is a good translation, right? Because uh, it's all about speaking it out. And you could look at whatever versions you like, but I'll read verse 1. In Isaiah 61, it says, He has sent me to repair, repair broken hearts. I'm curious, anybody here had their heart repaired by Jesus? Amen. Not just me? <laughs> and do you remember like before you knew the Lord and you were dating somebody and they broke up with you? I'm sure all of you were the ones that were doing the breaking up, right? <laughs> but man, when somebody breaks up with you and you still love them, and so, however they came up with the word broken heart, I can remember that, that it really felt like a broken heart. Anybody else? Like, you know, there's physical pain that you're feeling in your heart. Like, wow. And that's why the Bible's telling us to be so careful of who you get close to and who you're intimate with. That should be let out too soon. You want to have a covenant commitment before you go there. And he says right here, he sent me to repair broken hearts. And not just for broken relationships, for a million other reasons. This is such good news. To, to declare to those who are held captive and bound in prison, be free from your imprisonment. Be free from your imprisonment. He sent me to announce the year of Jubilee. Anybody know what that means? 50 years, right? In Israel, on the 50th year, debts were forgiven. Ho! Oh, so spiritually, this is not hard to figure out, is it? Your debt of needing to pay for your sin, all the sins that, that you came to me with, that debt has been forgiven, but at a very high price. At the price of Jesus hanging on that cross and being an open shame. Ho, oh, he was made an open shame. Why? For the joy that was set before him. Me and you. He endured the cross, despising the shame. I gotta give my life to a God like that. I can't go halfway. I've got to get all in with the Lord because it's the year of Jubilee. Now that's not just the 50th year because we're living in the Jubilee if we choose to tap into it. Again, that's what it's about. You've got to have enough faith to believe it. And without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you really have to fight this urge to say, yeah, but I tried and it didn't work. Okay, because there's many great ministers, great men of God will tell you that when they first started in their ministry, they didn't see the results. But faith tells you, I know God told me to do this, so I'm going to keep doing it. And if I pray for somebody and they die, that doesn't mean that God's not faithful. I'm going to keep praying. Because what's the alternative? <laughs> go back to sin? You want to go back to Egypt? <laughs> no thanks, I'm not. He sent me to announce the year of Jubilee. And it's not just a year. It's the year of the Lord's favor. That's what Jesus was saying. There's going to be a constant jubilee for those who are in the Lord. Could we come up with five things, if we wanted to, to complain about right now, today? Come on. Yeah, that's not a lack of faith. I just said, could you do it? We're not going to do it. I'm going to come up with five reasons to bless him, to, to thank him. I'm vertical. <laughs> I'm not horizontal. That's a good place to start. I'm alive. I'm breathing. Thank you, Lord. I was able to give today. I was able to, to bring an offering to my God. I woke up with a sound mind. I've been set free from fear. Oh, the favor of the Lord is on my life. Could it be better? Sure. But what did the devil say to, to Adam and Eve in the garden? He's always trying to come at us with that angle. That, but look what he didn't give you. And that's, that's a trick of the enemy, boy. Be careful. Don't fail to be grateful for the blessings on your life. Now, look, being married to Trisha has been a great experience in that she said, yes, we are grateful for what we have, but we want more. We want more of God's presence. And I'm like, well, is there ever going to be a time when you don't want more of his presence? I'm not talking about pos possessions. And she said, no. <laughs> as long as I'm alive, I'm going to seek more of God's presence. Because that's the only way, you know, it feels a little daunting to think, like, you don't get a vacation from this. Because once you get a taste of his goodness, you don't want to go back. 
you, you know, like Bill Johnson, I think, said, he's, Jesus is the thing that the more you eat, the hungrier you get. <laughs> right? I love that about God. And that's all this chapter sent me to announce the year of Jubilee. And for our enemies, it will be a day of God's wrath. For those who mourn, it will be a time of comfort. Verse 3, as for those who grieve over Zion, right, grieve over Zion, all the issues. We could say the modern day translation, wow, what's going on in America? It looks so bad. And God would come back and say, wait a minute, what are you doing about it? How are you praying for America? If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, purpose to seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, call out to me, what will he do? I will hear from heaven and heal your land. Look on the dollar bill in your wallet. It says, in God we trust. All right? That's the national motto of America. Huh. I won't go on that one. I'm going to stay in Isaiah 61. But for them that were grieving over Zion, God has sent me to give a beautiful crown in exchange for ashes. Whoa. A beautiful crown in exchange for ashes. Israel had sinned. The Roman army came in and destroyed the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD. But Babylon had done that hundreds of years earlier, right? And Daniel was taken out as a captive and brought into Babylon. And the city was just in ashes. And then Nehemiah gets this vision. I've got to go back and rebuild that. And that's such a beautiful picture for us, especially those of us that were caught up in a lot of sin using drugs and alcohol. The devil is such a mean boss. He really does come to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus says, no, but I've come to give you life. And not just surviving life, but abundance. An abundance of flourishing life. You're going to be like a tree planted by the river of living water. You're going to bring forth fruit. You're going to flourish in the garden of God because he's got all the tools. He's got everything we need if we're willing to submit to that authority and, and say, not my will, Lord. Your will be done. I choose to take on your authority over my life. So that beautiful crown, for me at least, was, man, like, why would you even let me in? I've, I've offended you with so much sin in my life, and, and I don't deserve it. And, and he would say, nobody deserves it. But will, are you willing to receive the beautiful crown for the ashes of your life? And it's really cool that Nehemiah, when he went back, took some of the burnt stones, and he rebuilt the wall with some of the burnt stones from the prior building. And that reminds us that even the things that the enemy was using for evil in our lives before we came to the Lord, God will turn around and use them for good. Because you have authority in that area. For me, I was playing music in, in a way that was not godly, I could tell you. He didn't tell me to stop. He just sanctified that gift. And so now use it for my glory. You were using it for other reasons. Now use it for my glory. So in some ways, you have more authority in those areas that you, you gained victory over, because if I'm talking to an alcoholic, I can say, I know God can set you free because he set me free. Hallelujah. Drug addiction, whatever it is, and all of us have a different story to tell, but however God moved in you, you now have authority in that area. You've got more authority in, in all areas too, but boy, it seems like a sweet spot, doesn't it? You had talked to Joyce Myers about sexual abuse. She carries an authority because her testimony is that God saved her from being horrifically abused by her father, her earthly father. Really worth watching. It's sobering to watch it, but the power of forgiveness. It's called One Life. Joyce Meyer, you can watch it on YouTube. She was given a beautiful crown in exchange for the ashes of her broken life. And then he's going to anoint us with gladness instead of sorrow. He's going to wrap us in victory. He's going to wrap us in joy. Praise instead of depression and sadness. Verse 6, Isaiah now, Old Testament, right? Verse 6, you will be known as the one specially chosen by the eternal God as priests. I think you need to look at the person next to you and say, you are chosen by God to be a priest. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. You represent the kingdom of God in the earth. Shine your light. Be an open epistle read by all men. Because his presence is in you. And those ashes got turned into a crown. And I have a feeling the crown has some jewels in it. 
and some light reflecting off it. Wow, what a turnaround. What a great exchange. One song called it the beautiful exchange. His glory for our sin. His life for our brokenness. And then he'll even use the broken stuff to give us authority on the other side of that life that he gives us. So we're ministers. This also says people will speak of you as ministers of our God. And the wealth of nations will come to you for your delight and your enrichment. I already quoted Deuteronomy 8.18, right? The reason we have the ability to get wealth is so that we can establish the covenant of God. Does he want to bless us? Of course he does. He's a good father. He doesn't want us living in a, in a, in a garbage dump. But he, he'll be there for us as long as we're there for him. As long as we're not taking it on to ourselves. That's another day's teaching, right? But boy, if I could just constantly remember that Jesus said... This is the year of the favor of the Lord, and today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. You could say that every single morning. We're in this new dispensation, this new era, where it's not just for a temporary time. It's the way we live our lives. The more connected we are to God, the more we will see these miracles happening, not just in our own lives, but when we lay hands and, and pray for other people too. How are we doing on time? I got my watch on here. 11-11. That's probably mean something, huh? <laughs> All right, I'm just going to share a little bit of what I tried to share with the young prophets yesterday, too. So we can think about all the theory, but the practice is where we actually live it out, right? It's, it's going and praying for people if you believe in healing, not just reading in the Bible that it says we can do that, it's actually doing it. And, and that's where we want to be mentored by seasoned Christians, and we want to be taught well, and there is spiritual authority. And you get that authority by serving and, and being willing and, and, and having a teachable spirit, right? So all of these things, as, as we have to give an account someday to the Lord for your lives, the first thing he could legitimately ask us is, how did you take care of my kids? What did you do to help them fulfill the calling that I, God would say, that I had on their life? And we can't look at each other and say, well, we preached, we, we taught them the Bible. That's not enough. Teaching people the Bible is not enough. If that's your child, you're praying to the Lord and saying, Lord, what's your plan for this child? And each child has a different plan. And if you have a lot of children, you've got to be specific and pray for each one because there's a different plan for each one. Same parents, different plan. That takes work, doesn't it? But isn't it amazing, those of you that are parents and you see your children stepping into the thing they were called to do? That's what John said. I have no greater joy than to see my children walking in the truth. Oh, it's amazing. Well, that's what God's going to say to us and say, what did you do? How did you help them grow into the gift that I put in them? Did you pray for them? Did you speak it over them? Did you say, this is what God is saying to me about you and who I want you to who God wants you to be? Well, if we haven't been there, we need to. And you could come up to us and say, I need you to speak into my life. What is God showing you about me? We should never f back off from that, okay? So that's all I'm saying. Theory's great. You have to understand the principles, but if we're not living them out, that's a big problem because you're only going to get good at it by doing it. All right, you got that, pr you got that point. And uh, there's this question that comes up often in Bible studies about the fruit of the Spirit, right? And, and I'm guessing a lot of you probably memorized it if you were raised a Christian and you were in Sunday school. How many say they could list off the fruit of the Spirit by memory? There's quite a few. Yeah, that's cool. It's good to know it up here. But I think sometimes we miss, like, we don't try to develop those fruit. We try to develop a relationship with God. And as a result of our relationship with God, what do we get? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We could go on and on, right? That's not a, a, an exhaustive list. It's just what, he, what he's trying to tell us, Paul is in Galatians there, he's saying, look, there's going to be evidence, like we sang today, right? I am evidence that God is real. Ha! My heart's been healed. I've been changed by his power coming into my life. But you can't try to produce more fruit. You're going to produce fruit. The question is, is it good fruit or bad fruit? <laughs> right? Well, don't judge me. Okay, I'm not judging you. You can decide for yourself what's good fruit and what's bad fruit. If it's lining up with scripture, great. So you could measure your fruit against this list, 
But Paul also gives a pretty long list of what is bad fruit, doesn't he? Murder, drunkenness, all these great words in the King James, lasciviousness. Like, I don't know what it means, but it sounds really bad, right? <laughs> Licentiousness. Well, the point is, the closer we get to him, the more our root system changes, and then our behavior automatically shifts, and the fruit, the quality of the fruit that's coming off of us improves. Doesn't mean it, all the bad fruit totally goes away, but the more we're in, a, in this interactive relationship with the Lord, the more likely it is that we're going to bear fruit for the kingdom of God. I see heads nodding, that's a good sign. So Jesus had a brother named James, and he's kind of like the Apostle Paul because he was right in your face. You know, he kind of cut right to the chase. He, he made his point clearly. And this is, again, from the Voice Bible, from James chapter 3. And you'll find in that little, short little epistle that James wrote, there's a lot of meat in there. I encourage you to read it. In verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 14, it says, if your heart is one that bleeds dark streams of jealousy and selfishness. <laughs> is that good fruit or bad fruit? You're paying attention. That wasn't on Paul's list of good fruit, was it? A dark stream of jealousy and selfishness. Then don't be so proud that you ignore your depraved state. <laughs> you don't get a lot of amens on this one. <laughs> but look, that's exactly what was going on in that uh, synagogue when Jesus said, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They were in a depraved state. They were the religious rulers. God was in their midst and they couldn't recognize it because he didn't come the way they were expecting. That's part of what a religious spirit will do to us is, is make us think that we already know what it's going to look like. He's way too big for that. We have to just stay open to what the spirit of God is telling us. Stay flexible in his hands. Live that prophetic lifestyle that we're constantly open. We know we study the word to show ourselves approved, but he applies it and shows us how to use it in different ways every day. Right? You can't eat yesterday's manna. Give us this day our daily bread, the bread that won't perish. But yesterday's man has got worms. So this is a, a requirement that we each day, that's why I say war for your altar. War for that place in the morning when you get down on your knees and say, Lord, today again, I can't do this without you. Just acknowledge it. Take communion right at your bedside before you eat, before you drink coffee. Take Take communion and connect with him. I'm going to war for my altar. I'm not going to let the world come in and steal it away from me. Like it's so hard. It's trying to do that it's so hard. It wants to rob your peace. Right now especially. <laughs> so James goes on to say, if you're dealing with that selfish jealousy and a depraved state, that's the wisdom of the world. Right? Let's see if I get it right here. The wisdom of this world should never be mistaken for heavenly wisdom. We could stay there for a while, couldn't we? When you come to church, you shouldn't be dealing with the wisdom of the world. You should be dealing with the word of God through the filter of Holy Spirit that says this is how we are to live our lives today. And the more complicated life gets, the harder it is to translate that, isn't it? Because you could say, well, when the Bible was written, there was no such thing as COVID-19. Well, they might not have called it that, but they had plagues in those days too. Right? I mean, there's just been healing going on from horrible things. Or you might think the world has changed in some other way. Listen, the Word of God has an answer for everything that we face. We just have to accept that. It's not always obvious what that answer is, but if we're willing to dig in there and really ask Him to show us, He'll do it. All right? So I'm not going to ignore my depraved state or bring in the wisdom of the world, because James goes on to say that originates below in the earthly realm with demons. <laughs> I told you, he's straight up. He's going to give it to you like it is. I don't want anything to do with that way of thinking. I want my mind renewed by the word of God. Amen. That's how we see that year of jubilee and the year of the Lord's favor. I'm finishing now. Proverbs 18, 16. You might know it because it says, your gift will make room for you and bring you before a great man. Anybody know that? Yeah. And that could be your, your gift, like Terry has a gift to sing. That was obvious today, right? Yeah. Give a hand to Terry. Yeah. You know why I say that? Because the devil tried to steal her breath when she was a child. She was so sick with asthma, had such a severe case of asthma, she almost died from it. So when you hear her sing, it's like, oh yeah, devil, another black eye. When you hear Martin pray into the microphone, <laughs> he got a good volume, doesn't he? You might say he doesn't even need the microphone. 
He had throat cancer. Devil tried to take his throat, tried to squeeze out his breath. No way, devil. He's going to pray. He's going to sing of the goodness of God. All my life, Lord, you've been faithful. So that's what we do. We remember where we came from. But I love the way it says it in the voice. It says, not just that your gift will make room for you, but he says the right gift at the right time can open up new opportunities and gains us access to influential people. What a great way to live. And again, I'm not trying to be critical of any other version of Christianity, but if, if our version of Christianity has taken it out of the application of everyday living, then that's a mistake. He never meant it to be just a holding pattern until we die and go to heaven. He meant it to be an abundant life. I came to give you life abundantly here, now. The kingdom of God is in the earth. It's the year of Jubilee. It's the year of the Lord's favor to the degree that you want to tap into it. It's not so easy. Because you have an opponent, right? You have somebody coming against you who's a really good liar. And you can't believe the lies. You have to say, it is written, Satan, just like Jesus did. So one of the things I tried to explain over the years is this thing called prophetic scaffolding. All right, scaffolding is what they put up on the outside of a building, and, and the analogy was if you want to bring a tool to the person on the 10th, who's on the 10th floor, you've got to bring it down to the first floor, you don't just hang that tool and drop it, do you? Because if it lands on them on the first floor, they're dead. You didn't help them. So you try to meet them where they are. You, you go to where they are and you hand them the tool. And, and we're not always willing to do this in life. Are we willing to really look at the person that we're talking to, if it's somebody on our job who's not saved, and they're asking us, well, what's Christianity all about? That's an amazing opportunity, isn't it? See, the right gift at the right time, that's what this says, can open up new opportunities. But if we're not alert to what, to what Jesus is trying to tell us here, it's like, don't just give them a pat answer. Pause in that moment and say, Lord, what do you want me to say to this person right now in this time? That takes a little effort, doesn't it? Because we tend to just blurt out the first thing that comes to our mind. But no, he wants us to live in this disciplined place that it would be the right gift at the right time for the right person. And, and this is how I want to live the rest of my life. I wish I knew this younger because I did kind of buy into that philosophy. Well, I'm saved now. I'm not perfect. I'm going to still make mistakes. But when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. That's true, but that's way underneath the full version of what he wants for us to do. He wants us to be change agents, emissaries. You ever hear that word? I love that word. An emissary for the kingdom of God in the earth, but a prophetic emissary. Somebody who can read where the person at, is at in that scaffolding. So I talked to my sister-in-law, Linda. She's already an expert at witnessing to people. I mean, basically every time I have a conversation with her, she's telling me who she witnessed to that day. That's her gift. It's an amazing gift. And I don't have to go into detail with her about it. She's already experiencing it and doing it and leading people to the Lord. But I meet somebody else, I've got to have enough sense to say they don't have that experience. So they need a different approach, right? This is the, this is the current way that the Spirit of God wants to work in our lives. There's so many opportunities that we have on a daily basis to use the gift that God gives us. And how good does it feel when somebody accepts the Lord? I mean, we actually, she tells us about this one lady all the time. And there's been such a transformation over the last couple years. When we would hear it at the beginning, it was really sounding bad. And then all of a sudden, God just came through. She would give the lady CDs from the church and different teachers that would come in and down the online services. There's been a transformation in this lady's life. All because of somebody on her job who was brave enough to witness to her. That's a force for the kingdom in the earth. And that's one way, but there's a million ways to do it. Just don't, don't restrict God, amen? So I think I only have one more. Go to uh, Philippians in your Bible, okay? Philippians chapter 2. And uh, I'm going to end with this little portion here. And uh, you might say, well, how come you didn't put the slides up on the screen today? Anybody thinking that? <laughs> so I want you to bring your Bible. <laughs> uh, there you go, Lucy. Now that's not the only reason. I just, I, I just want to make sure doing that is the right thing because we got we to gotta love our Bibles. We got to dig in there. And I'm, I'm not trying to say it was wrong to put the scriptures up on the screen. You just didn't lead me to do that this week because there's something about hearing it and seeing it in your book or on screen, however you're looking at your Bible. 
that helps us that when we get back to that portion of scripture, we remember being there when we were in a church service, right? You take notes in your Bible and, you know, like, wow, you should see Trisha's Bible sometime. Lots of notes, lots of underlining, lots of circles, lots of yellow highlights. And this is really key, I think. I mean, obviously the whole Bible's key, but to what we're talking about today, this year of the Lord's favor, that it's not just 365 days. It's a, it's a mindset. It's a way to live with the Lord. You fill me with your spirit. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive in me, God. I am a force for the kingdom of God. I do have some fruit that I want to see change. And I'm willing to work on that. But look at all the good fruit you've brought already in my life. See, you're not beating yourself up to admit that there's some things that need to change. He'll help us. All right, you ready? Philippians 2.6. I'm going to read it from, it's called the Kingdom New Testament. Though in God's form, Jesus did not regard his equality with God as something he ought to exploit. So remember I said, the way of thinking in the world is from demons, right? That was James. That's the Lord's brother. He said, if you allow worldly thinking into your life, that's coming from the pit of hell. It's got, you have to be driven by the Spirit. You've got to be driven by the truth of the Word of God. So... If anybody could have ever pulled rank, it could have been Jesus, right? But he didn't. He didn't think that being equal with God was something that he could exploit and lay on somebody and say, well, don't you know who I am? You're going to disagree with me? Before Abraham was, I am. <laughs> but he wasn't challenging them. He just was making a statement, right? He didn't pull rank. He told his disciples, I don't want you pulling rank. I don't want you competing for position. The best position is right there. That's how you want to be great in the kingdom? Serve. Nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> they want to get the big corner office. You might get the corner office, but you're more likely to get it if you do it Jesus' way than if you do it the world's way. The devil's just a liar, you know? He'll just trick you into something and then pull the rug out from under you. God's much, much more faithful. So Jesus says, I'm in God's form, but I'm not going to use that to pull rank on you. I'm going to model a life that you can live by. In verse 7, it says, he emptied himself and received the form of a servant. Some translations say the form of a slave. So he was willing to be obedient to the Father, be born in human likeness. The rest of 7 says, having human appearance, he humbled himself, became obedient even to death. Yes, the death of the cross. The most disgraceful way anybody could die in the day that Jesus was alive was to be hung naked on a cross. And it take two days sometimes for you to die. Read about it your own sometime. I mean, there's a guy named Tom Holland right now who's a historian. Atheist. By studying Christianity, he became a Christian. <laughs> it's just amazing. Because... That story, that G, you know, being a historian, he knew the shame that was involved with, uh, with crucifixion and, and the attempt of the Romans to use it as a way to dissuade people. It was a deterrent because if you want to scare somebody into not breaking the law, you walk into the town and you see a bunch of people crucified and they tell you, this is what happens around here if you break the law. That has a pretty powerful effect. That the Son of God would die in that form just was incomprehensible to this guy. And I just love seeing people come out of that darkness of that worldly way of thinking and say, no, it had to be God. You'd never make up a story like that, that he would love us that much and so unconditionally. And God so greatly exalted him, ho, oh, and gave him his favor and given him a name which is above every other name that now at the name of Jesus every knee under heaven and earth shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Can we stand? Maybe you just extend your hands out to either side because I know we can't really hug right now, but the families can hug. That's probably a good idea. Public display of affection. And I think we all just could pray for each other for a minute here that all this separation and all this isolation is not going to have an effect on my life. You need to make a stand and say that. And say, no way.
Devil, you are not stealing my joy. You are not stealing my peace. You are not getting me to focus on what I don't have because I serve a God who's the God who gives me things that I do have. And he gives me blessing upon blessing. And I'm living in a year of jubilee. In the midst of a COVID crisis, I'm living in a year of jubilee. So if you just could stick your hands out like this and receive that peace right now. Lord, I just speak it over the body of Christ. Those that are here right now, that all of the trauma that people have been through in the last five or six months, losing loved ones, all the hard things about looking at the culture and not understanding what's going on and why there seems to be a double standard. We're not going to allow confusion to reign in our lives. We come back to the Prince of Peace. That's who you are, Jesus. I speak that over you right now. I speak the Prince of Peace is going to rule and reign on the throne of your life. Not chaos, not confusion, not hatred, not political bantering in your brain where you got all this self-talk going on in your brain. We serve Christ, okay? Republican, Democrat falls underneath what we just read. Every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But let's be him. We're his representatives, we're his emissaries, right? So let's just reflect that. So I just speak that peace over you right now. I break confusion off of your brain and off of your mind that he would give you his thoughts. And when you're not sure what to do, we're going to say like Jehoshaphat, Lord, there's a big army coming against us. We don't know what to do, so we're looking to you. I speak that over you right now. That's going to be your default setting. When you're not sure, you're going to say, what does the word of God say? Not what is the Republican saying, what's the Democrat saying? We need them. I get it. It's a complicated process out there. But we got to keep our eyes this way, right? And maybe if, if you're okay with this, let's just kneel down for a minute. We don't do this enough anymore. But it's a good thing to do. And just recognize that this is a place of power, not weakness. Amen? Because what you're doing when you do this is you're aligning with what he did for us right here that David quoted when Jesus washed the feet. But it's also the best place to hear the Lord's voice in my life. I don't know if you found that to be true. But in my life, if I want to remember that this is the year of the Lord's favor, that I'm going to hear from you is by first acknowledging that it's not my might, it's not my power, it's by the Spirit of God. So Lord, as we kneel here before you today, we recommit our lives. We're reminding our spirit man and our flesh that we are subject to the authority of Scripture. We're subject to the authority of the name of Jesus, which is above every name. And we're not going to wait to bow our knee to you. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. I do it right now. I'm confessing that you are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the chosen, sent by the Father to save me. The wages of sin was death, but your life brought me life. And I receive it now, Lord. I receive that eternal life, that life, that quality of life that just shifts me out of the worldly thinking and into le being led by your spirit in everything I do. Lord, could you just put your hand on your head for a minute? Just clear us, Lord. Detox our thoughts of anything that doesn't line up with the truth of your word. Help me have like a Geiger counter in my brain to say, nope, that's a lie, that's a lie. I'm not listening to that, that's a lie. And then just be attracted to the truth. I'm going to be attracted and like a magnet, I'm going to be drawn to the truth of the word and how I live my life for me, but also for my family, for my loved ones, for the extended people that I come in contact with. Wherever I have a sphere of influence, let it be redemptive, Lord. Let it be redemptive. I had a picture one time that when I knelt down like this, that I had two prongs like a plug and that I was being in inserted into a socket and that God's power was coming up because I was making that connection. So that helps me see this as a place of power and not as a place of weakness, right? Because that's what the world would say. But when I'm doing this, I'm submitting myself to him and saying, I recognize I cannot do this on my own, Lord. I need you. And church, can we just say this? We need each other. Hasn't it been good to see other Christians today? Hasn't it been different to worship together and to hear people blowing the shofar again? Let's stand up. Yeah, let's stand up because we need each other. 
And this has been a plan of the enemy to try to steal that time of fellowship together. But that season's over. Amen. That season's over. I wish I could tell you exactly how we were going to proceed, when we were going to go to two services, how we're going to do it. There's just too many answers there that I don't have yet. But I said yet because I know it's important. I know it's especially important to people at home that didn't get here. But we're going to try to keep it fair so people can come see the place. Isn't it a cool place? Yeah, yeah it's a cool place. It's another gift from God. So we just celebrate that, Lord. We just celebrate that. And we celebrate the role that you have us play in this culture to be your emissaries, to be the light that's going to shine in the darkness. The last prayer I just want to pray over you is a prayer of peace. We've been singing that song, The Blessing, so much. I can't help it. The Lord bless you and keep you. Oh, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord give you peace. May his favor be upon you and around you and beside you. He'll go with you wherever you go. He's there with you. And I just speak the Lord's blessing over your life right now. On you, on your family, your children, your children's children. Even in your weeping, he'll be there. Even in your mourning, but also in your rejoicing, he'll be there with you. Can we just give him a standing ovation as we end today? Praise God. Say it with me. We're crossing over. We're crossing over. Yes, it sounds good to hear you say it. We're crossing over, church. Have an awesome day. We love you.